Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Hymnology, a show about psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and the people who sing them. My name is Sawyer. Today on the show we are going to be talking about the next generation of songwriters. The next generation of songwriters, second generation songwriters, and the music that they sing and write. And our guest today is none other than Sky Peterson. Now, Sky Peterson is a singer-songwriter out of Nashville, Tennessee, and you may know her as Andrew Peterson's daughter. Um, she is going to be going on tour here pretty soon on the Resurrection Letters Tour with her father and releasing an album later on in the summer. Sky and I were able to talk about kind of her background growing up in, in, in a musical home, um, being a second generation songwriter and kind of the things that she's grateful to be able to receive from that, um, but also the sound of this generation of songwriters. Um, so I'm excited for you to hear this interview and all that Sky has to say. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Hymology. And today I have a special guest with me today by the name of Sky Peterson. Sky, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, um, most of you, if you um, don't know Sky's music yet, um, but you are a fan of her father, Andrew Peterson, you probably feel like you know her a little bit just from listening to um, his music and, and reading um, his books. But um, Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of your background and uh, where you are today? Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, my dad is a singer songwriter. And uh, so I've always kind of been surrounded by music and I've loved it from the very beginning. Sarah Groves was my songwriting hero. Okay. Uh, so I grew up listening to her and Sandra McCracken and yeah, uh, yeah just kind of fell in love with writing songs about Jesus. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of how I got started. And I went and studied theology for a bit uh, okay. because I thought that that would help enhance my songwriting. And now I'm in Nashville, uh, still trying to write, working uh, with some hymn writers. That's kind of been my full time thing, but I'm also making yeah. a record right now. Uh, so yeah. kind of like trying to do both at the same time. OK. And where did you study at? Uh, I studied at Cape Ray Hall. It's this like cool, small Bible school in England. OK. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. It was in yeah. this like 400 year old castle <laughs> yeah. with like 100 students. Hey, so nothing perfect. wrong with studying. Nothing wrong with studying theology at Hogwarts. It always makes it a little more, exactly. a little more exciting. Um, so yeah, I kind of I, I didn't go to England to do that, but I I did not study music in school and did and did theology, and I found that that helped probably not have helped me a little bit more down the road. Um, do you do you find that that are you thankful that you went the theology route as opposed to, hey, I'm going to go study music? Yeah, yeah, I definitely am. Partly because, well, whenever I graduated high school, I wasn't super sure that songwriting was what I wanted to do. So yeah. to go somewhere and just kind of go to school to not get a degree, but just to become a better human <laughs> and, yeah. you know, strengthen your relationship with the Lord. And, yeah. you know, all cliche things are true. Like, uh, I think you need to go to school and experience some real life. And yeah. I think that's what um, helped my songwriting more than just like the information I received. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I've talked to a lot of musicians that uh, who have gone to school to study music, uh -huh. uh, you know, have, have been grateful for it, but it hasn't been like uh, ne necessary maybe for what they're doing at yeah. the moment, you know, like yeah. I think most people go to uh, school for music to get the connections yeah. um, and like, Thank goodness uh, my dad is who he is because I, yeah. I get this really cool, unique um, kind of foot in the door yeah. <laughs> uh, to all of these people and connections and already. Yeah. So I, I think that just having experienced like growing up in the music field uh, and also already like being able to be mentored by all of these musicians made it so yeah. that uh, studying music would just kind of be a bunch of in information that I don't necessarily need yeah. um, for the kind of writing that I want to do. Yeah, it, definitely. And I, I agree. I feel like, I feel like you get more of what actually flows out whenever in songwriting by studying theology. Mm -hmm. that, and that was just my experience, you know, some, some were different. Um, I never saw myself need, and you know, I, I needed to, to go that route, but like, what, what would you say that like what you've been studying has come out in your music? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I, it definitely has. I think um, hmm, there are a couple different routes I could take this. I mean, take them both. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I feel like the, the hardest thing for artists and songwriters is yeah. um, like having a blank piece of paper in front of you and like, all right, I know how to write a song, but I have no idea what to write about. Right. And uh, the cool thing about Christian music in particular is uh, you know, God is such a, a grand topic that yeah. uh, there's so many things to write about. And especially if you're kind of writing um, like kind of uh, story songs yeah. or uh, not necessarily like worship songs, but right. songs about your life uh, and your story, which happen to be kind of near the bigger, grander story that we're all a part of, right? It's yeah. really cool to kind of get uh, studying theology and um receiving about a lot of knowledge about the Lord and the word and scripture is just all inspiration for how to work that into your music too. So it's just really helpful to kind of have um, a path that you can take that kind of along the way gives you all of these cool ideas for songs. You could take one verse in the Bible and you could write 10 songs about it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Which I I love that, that that's how it works. Like I love that the word is so inspiring that, you can just take it and run with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And um, kind of going along with that, notice your, your bookshelf back there. What, what are some, some books that kind of inspire your, your songwriting? This has nothing to do with our topic, by the way. I'm just kind of going off, <laughs> off of what you say. Um, this book, hold on, you got it. It's, um, it's Be Thou My Vision. Oh yeah. Yeah. I haven't got that yet. Yeah. Oh man. It's great. So the, the uh, hymn writer, Team that I'm on right now. Yeah. Uh, we had like a session and we studied this and had like the speaker. Okay. And it's just, it's wonderful. Um, Every Moment Holy, have you heard of that? I have, yeah. Okay. I have yeah. it on myself. Yeah. Yeah. Both of those, both of those two books have been super helpful where I'll just flip through and kind of um, be like, all right, I'm going to write a song about confession yeah. today. Or I'm yeah. going to write a song about like assurance of pardon. And yeah. uh, it's, it's amazing to have those sources. Uh, we've yeah. also, yeah. In in every moment, just speaking of every moment, holy, real quick. You know that's one that has come up um, with almost everybody that I talk to about. You know, I, this seems to be right now that not I don't think it's a trend. I think it's more of where the church is heading. Um, mm-hmm. Is is um, our music to actually relate to our everyday? You know, and not not just singing about our everyday, but worshiping through our everyday. And, um, and, and that seems to be a trend, um, that not a trend, but like a movement that's happening right now. What, what, what would you say to that? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think so too. The, the, the songs that like speak to me the most are the songs that talk about like everyday ordinary yeah. things. Yeah. Cause I think we can all relate to that. I think we all like ache to be able to resonate with a song or yeah. a story or, and so the, so I think that that's like where the, the moving in our hearts comes from is whenever yeah. Like, oh, I feel that way too. And whenever we get like specific in our songwriting or specific in our writing, that's whenever um, I feel like it speaks to people most. And it's so cool. Like um, there's so many hymns that do that to me where I'm like, oh, this is a nice, pretty song. But then a, li- a line will like hit me yeah. because I know what that feels like. And yeah. uh, that's what makes me love the song is because yeah. I know, yeah, yeah, I can relate to it, you know? Right. Yeah. And I haven't, I haven't, I haven't got be that my vision yet, but I've heard kind of the same thing. I know it's a little bit newer, um, but I've, I've heard kind of the same thing about that, how it kind of just walks you through. And um, I go through the, the book of common prayer and that kind of helps me, but I've kind of been able to tell this is kind of like a, a new version of, of that to, to the same degree. But um, what about fiction? What, uh, I, I know what, obviously wing feather saga has been a big thing for you, but um, what about, what kind of uh, fiction kind of keeps you going in, in songwriting? Well, it's kind of funny. I'm actually not really a reader. I really, oh, really? Want, I really want to be because all the people I love and respect are readers, yeah. and like they have something that I don't. Um, yeah. Plus, I I just know that as a songwriter, you need like input. <laughs> I like uh, to buy books. Yes, I know. I, <laughs> like, I love the way this looks. Yeah. <laughs> I have I I know how to organize a bookshelf to make it look like I'm a great reader, but um, you know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm more of a, more of a podcast guy to to actually pull content from. So. yeah no I'm, I'm the same way but I'm, I'm trying I'm starting off with like little books like I just read this um the practice of the presence of God okay and it's like 
120 pages. Yeah. I, I can do that. Yeah. Uh, but so I'm trying to think of the last fiction, fictional book that I read. Um, I have, I've read the first three Narnia. That's okay. I, I haven't even finished Narnia, which I feel like a shame to be Andrew Peterson's kid and say that I haven't read Narnia, but. Well, it's okay. I mean, I, I named my, my, I named my daughter Lucy and I haven't read all of them. So it, it's okay. <laughs> I've got, I've gotten the main ones now. And then I think, I'm good. So, no, there's, oh, there's, there's no shame. That's right. There's no shame. <laughs> um, well, let's go ahead. And, and since you just mentioned your dad, let, let's go into, um, a topic that I don't think we get to talk about very often because I think there's so few of them. Um, but that's the topic of generational songwriting. Um, most of us, I would imagine, um, who are in who are into songwriting um, probably start out a little angsty, you know, when they, you know, they turn 13, 14. Mm -hmm. um, the world seems unfair. And um, that may be from poems or, or whatever it is. But um, most of the time, I wouldn't say that they have a person who they live with to pull from, you know, they have, they have the kind of the, in other words, they are not the second generation songwriter. Um, mm -hmm. Usually, usually the first, um, at least when it comes to a familial deal, you know, they may be a second generation as far as their inspirations. Um, yeah. But when it comes to their parents or grandparents, that's generally not the case. Um, so can you kind of speak to, what it's like and kind of how that's influenced you being able to pull from um, the first generation of songwriting and now being the second generation in your family to, to do that. And I know your, your siblings are kind of in that world too. Um, so what, how, how do you think that's benefited you um, by being that second generation? Yeah. Um, Not that you know any different, <laughs> but you know, yeah, just yeah. from your experience, you know, well, I think of, I mean, uh, I don't know how much you know about like my dad and his childhood, but he, he had to work pretty hard to get where he is now. You know, he worked at Olive Garden for the first like five years of moving yeah. to Nashville. Like he carried cassette tapes in his pocket and gave yeah. them out. Like he had to um, work really hard. Whereas um, I don't think that I would be doing what I'm doing if it weren't for him and if it weren't for... Uh, you know, his encouragement and kind of seeing his, his process has inspired me to start the process too. So yeah. there are a lot of really, um, like I'm grateful in a lot of ways, uh, to be able to look up to him because right. he's worked really hard and it makes yeah. me feel like I also have to work hard. Um, yeah. there's also like this, um, I mean, kind of like what we were talking about earlier. Like I have my foot in the door because of, yeah. you know, my dad's name, which yeah. is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and so, I've, I've actually kind of like struggled with figuring out how to, uh, you know, take my dad's name and be grateful for it and not feel like it's, that's the only reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, I'm really good at listening to like the lies in my head. And so yeah. uh, there's a kind of a constant lie that's like, oh, people only like you because you're Andrew Peterson's kid and not yeah. because your songs are actually good. Yeah. And like, my songs are awesome. No, I'm just kidding. That's right. uh, I, I feel like, uh, the, the, the truth is um, my songs are different than his and my songs are, uh, you know, they're Sky Peterson songs, not Andrew Peterson songs. Yeah. You know? So there's this, uh, I could either <laughs> kind of wallow in the fact, oh, like, you know, I didn't get myself here, like my dad got me here. Or I could be like, wow, how cool is it that I get to, you know, be a part of the same world of people and have, yeah. you know, one of the best singer songwriters I know yeah. live in the same house as me, you know? Yeah. Uh, so there are a lot of like advantages. There are also like a lot of opportunities for me to, you know, listen to the lies, yeah. but it takes like extra work too. And then there's that third aspect where you could, and I don't think you're this way, but you could be like, well, my dad is Andrew Peterson, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, and I know you're not like that, but it could be easy to, to fall into be. that trap. Like, oh, I know I'm going to be on the stage at sing because yeah. my father's Andrew, mm -hmm. you know, you, you could be that way. Um, so let, let's, one thing I think maybe we don't talk about enough, um, your, your mother, who has also been a big inspiration for your father, yeah. how does she inspire you as, as, a, as a songwriter? And not even just as a songwriter, but just as, as her daughter. Oh, man. My, my mother is my best friend in the entire world. She's the best. Yeah, uh, yeah no, she's wonderful. Uh, she's 
she has the gift, gift of hospitality and uh, has, <laughs> whenever we first bought uh, our house or that yeah. the house that I grew up in, right. which they're still living in now, yeah. 15 years later, uh, they, the house was just hideous, so ugly. It was like this like pale tan color <laughs> carpet in the bathroom, like hot pink walls, ugly yeah. wallpaper. I mean, just like disgusting. And now like you wouldn't even believe it if you walked into our house, how yeah. different it is because of my mother, like my mom's um, constant devotion to making it beautiful. Yeah. So that's kind of a picture of what she's kind of done in all of us too. Like she's mm. slowly over time, like ministering to us and yeah. just, she's like one of the best listeners I know. And yeah. anyway, she's been, she actually, I don't know if you know, my brothers and I started a band called Wake Low. Um, okay. Yeah. Twenty. Yeah. Uh, and she was the one that actually made that happen. So, okay. we, uh, you know, she's the, you know, classic mother figure who's just like the yeah. biggest fan of her kids um right. and so you know we've talked about my brothers and I have talked about forming a band for a long time and yeah. we we're one day after we were like having tacos one Monday night and uh yeah. we were like dreaming about this idea of someday making a record all three kids and yeah. my mom was like what's stopping you yeah and we're like well I mean there there's a lot that goes into it and she's like go have a meeting about it yeah right now yeah, <laughs> and so we'll like it. literally right after that had a meeting and then the next month we like started yeah. Kickstarter. so anyway she's like this like kind of the heartbeat of our house of yeah. our home and um just constantly pushing us to do things uh and i so i actually one of the songs that's going to be on my new record which we'll probably talk about later we will yeah uh, is kind of the, the theme of the record uh which is like um finding the kingdom here on earth and like the little like pop windows we get and my yeah. my mom is uh both my parents are just like really want they kind of have made our home like a little picture of what i hope the kingdom will someday be like yeah uh, where it's like always welcoming the door is always unlocked like people are just flowing in and out and you know we have house concerts and we have yeah. like lectures and it's just like such a wonderful beautiful picture of the kingdom uh yeah. so anyway my mother has been like such a big encouragement to me in yeah. my music and I just am like so grateful yeah and I'll I'll watch the last uh, uh local show at, at uh at your your parents house and and yeah. your your mom definitely has to be hospitable <laughs> or exactly. uh or that would not happen uh definitely yeah. not. And, and you know I, I ask that because you know typically we think of you know okay well who is the most quote unquote successful and now let's pull those traits into that person into the next generation but um you know, I, I would, I would imagine your dad would say, well, it's, it's, it's a lot more than just me, you know, it's also, you know, your, your mom. And, yeah. and, and so we take both of those aspects into a second generation songwriter. And, and I, and I think we hear both of those in your music. You know, I, I, I told my wife the other day when I was listening, I was listening to, um, listen to that local show and, and, and you were singing and I was like, man, you definitely know that that's Andrew Peterson's daughter but you but like what you how you just described your mother um you can definitely hear that too um you know just the just the hospitality in your songwriting welcoming people in into kind of that story that you're that you're wanting to tell and so you can definitely hear those those things and so so now we have you as in that second generation but you're also i mean you're young you know how old are you now not you're you're 19 19 mm -hmm. okay um and I think that we do live in a very, um, I don't know the right word to say this. I'm just going to say it, um, youthful uh, culture when it comes to songwriting in the mainstream. Yeah. You know, that is who, that's who we think is, you know, if you're not successful by the time you're 40, then hmm. forget it, you know. Um, however, on the flip side of that, when it comes to Christian music in the worship world. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. So you are kind of in that new generation of, of songwriters, which I think we need. Um, what do you think that that is going to sound like as, as your age group, your generation continues on? What do you, what do you think is going to be the sound of the song of your generation? That's a great question. And I'm sure you have the perfect answer for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, uh, I genuinely, I don't know. I'm curious how different uh, this generation's music is going to sound than yeah. like my, my dad's generation. Because yeah. I was just thinking uh, the other day about how there aren't very many people uh, in kind of 
that, that are trying to be like the Sarah Groves and Andrew Peterson of like, yeah, the, of their day. Yeah. Of their day, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so even like, it's been hard for me to find, and I'm sure they're out there and I just haven't found them yet, yeah. but it's, it's been hard for me to find uh, people that aren't, or younger artists that aren't trying to, uh, you know, make good music, but that's also like secular that, yeah. you know, like anyone can listen to just because uh, I, I feel like the, like Christian music has become more of a narrow yeah. um, genre. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so there's, there, there are not many artists that you can listen to um, that, or not, I should say, not many Christian artists that you can listen to that a non-Christian would also like, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and I had that conversation with with uh, Sandra McCracken because you know she just put out her her, her album of, of covers, and we talked about like it's really easy for a, a secular artist to mm-hmm. sing a, a worship song, Christian song, and it be popular, mm-hmm. but it's really hard for a Christian artists to sing a cover, you know, huh. and, and it be popular. Yeah. Um, so that's a so that's a weird. So I think you're right. I think that's a hard thing to to find. Yeah. Um, why do you think that, why do you think not many people are trying to follow in those footsteps? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, uh, our culture is just getting more and more relativistic and okay. we're just all trying to, uh, I mean, we're, we're surrounded by people that are like, you know, your truth is different from my truth. And, yeah. um, and so that makes it like singing a song about like the truth of the gospel is way yeah. harder because yeah people are like, oh yeah, well, that'll sound nice and pretty, but is that actually yeah. true? Because yeah. that can be true for you, but it can't be true for me, yeah. which, you know, I could rant about, but I won't. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that people are trying, like I, I've tried to find the balance between this too, because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I want the songs that I sing at a concert um, right. to be like open to any kind of beliefs. Like, you know, I'll, just like last week there was like a um a Jewish couple sitting on the front row and I loved that like it made me so happy that like um the truth was still getting to them too yeah Uh, so anyway trying to find I I think that's why I mean I have a couple uh friends that are trying to do what I do uh except without labeling themselves as a Christian artist uh and I love that I mean you listen to artists like Colony House (laughs) and it's like a you know a hard yeah. rock band, but they're yeah. still like, I, I went to one of their concerts a few weeks ago and, you know, they had a whole like 600 people uh, in the audience screaming, like, uh, sing it like a soldier, come on, carry, yeah. uh, oh shoot, I'm getting the lyrics wrong. But like something that's inevitably true, like, um, and even though it's not necessarily like a Christian theme, like they're still like, it, they're still singing about the truth. So finding that way to still share the truth without scaring people off is yeah. so, so hard. Especially and and artist. to backtrack into our conversation about second generation songwriting, this, this came up whenever you were talking about that and not, I'm glad you said it, but um, Colony House being Stephen Curtis Chapman's son. Mm, yeah. You know, so mm. maybe you know, maybe that that's kind of where your generation is going with with songwriting, because I think for so long we've had the, you know, and and I don't I don't like using the cliche terms, but um, you do have the the Jesus as boyfriend songs, which mm-hmm. I think maybe tried to. I don't want to write those off because I think that it attempted something. Um, but there's a difference between that and what we're talking about. You know, mm-hmm. we're like you said, we're putting truth, biblical truth. Um subjective biblical truth into also songs that are a story for everyone and um i love it i love that's kind of where i hear like you and 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 colony house and and i don't think it's just a second generation thing i think it's just a a that generation thing you know and i think it's a great thing because i mean gen z gets a bad rap you know millennials get a bad rap and i think it's good that this is where where things are going let's talk about accessibility though um you mentioned that your dad worked at Olive Garden and had to hand out cassettes. <laughs> uh, we don't have to do that, you know. Um, Thank the Lord. Yeah. So we're going to talk about your Kickstarter in a second and, and kind of how, um, you know, one, one way that you can record a record is, is going all out, doing it in a studio. Mm-hmm. But, um, but 
how accessible have you recorded music? I mean, I'm sure you've made it as easy as you can be in the past too. Like, what does your recording process look like from like your first round of it to, yeah. to now? Yeah. I mean, uh, Garage Band is, was my yeah. best friend growing up. Yeah. I, my parents actually just found this like tiny little album that I made at like age five. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so but yeah, like my dad helped me record it on GarageBand, so that yeah. was just my living room. But uh, the first EP that I did, uh, I, th I think I was fourteen. I think I wrote the songs when I was thirteen, and then, yeah. So anyway, they're terrible songs, but I'm glad that I did it. But <laughs> right. I had yeah. because my dad, um, you know, w wanted me to do the do the real thing. Yeah. Uh, he really encouraged me to like do a, a little Kickstarter. Yeah. So it was. Like, 5,000 bucks yeah. uh, and um, raised it pretty quick. You know, yeah. I've got the, this guy named Greg LaFollette to produce it, who's one of our friends. So yeah, anyway, yeah. I had a, a mini picture of what it would actually be like. And right. it was so fun. Like, I, it just made me fall in love with it. Yeah. And it was because, you know, my dad knows me well and knows. Yeah. And I also, like, one of the things I really appreciate about my dad is he kind of, like, um, uh, has... Like he wasn't super picky with the songs that I did yeah. whenever I was 14 yeah. and kind of let them be the songs that they were then. And he didn't yeah. try to like make them any better, but he was like, all right, Sky just needs to experience what it's like to put out an EP. Yeah. Um, and not listening, listening back to it now, like it's laughable. I made up words in that song. Like yeah. they're, it's, it's hilarious right. to listen to, but uh, yeah. So that was kind of the first thing. And then my brother is a producer. Asher okay. then is, um, he, he's worked a lot with Colony House and okay. mentored, he was mentored by Ben Shive and he got him plugged in. So he's like doing full-time production now yeah. when, when he's not drumming. But anyway, he's, he and I have worked a lot together uh, okay. over the years. So all throughout high school, whenever he was still at our house or the house that I was living in, uh, we would often, I would kind of like sneak into his, you know, bedroom and I'd be like, yeah. Hey, you want to make a song? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. just, jam a lot and Aiden my other brother he, he's an animator but he's also this killer songwriter too okay. uh, so a, a lot of times it would just kind of happen organically which yeah. is I think the best songs come organically yeah whenever uh yeah you're just kind of letting letting your mind wander and right let the process work itself out you know yeah and and you know it even even just like what you said about a kickstarter um I mean, even that is is just a sign of, of things being more accessible, you know, um, mm -hmm. just to be able to, I need this much money. Let's see who, yeah. let's see how much we can do before, before we do this. If you don't, if you don't want to do the bedroom recording thing, you know, it is possible um, mm -hmm. to, to do that. And, and I hope, and, I re, and the reason I say this is because, you know, if anyone's listening to this and is, is younger, you know, is, is, is your age or younger. Um, I'm, I used, used to be a student pastor. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking students here. Um, you know, and this is something that they want to do. You know, it is, it is a possibility, you know, you don't have to be a second generation songwriter to, to do yeah. this. You know, well, you, you could do it from, from your bedroom. If you, if you, yeah. if you knew how to do it, or you could possibly, um, raise the money to, to have it done. Now it's scary. You know, it's scary to ask people for money to do these kind of things, but yeah. it, it can definitely be done in, in your, uh, your testament to that. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that yeah. my, um, one of the coolest things about music is that you can't do it alone. Like right. you need, you need community and, yeah. uh, it's in, in Nashville, especially, I mean, I feel like every other house has a stu studio in it. It's like, yeah. I'm living in like this, uh, big house that has a couple suites in it and almost every single one of, um, the suites has like a mandolin player right next door. I can hear it like every day. There's right. a piano player in the next one. So I just love that. It's like, you know, you're surrounded by people that are also trying their yeah. hardest to do, and they're all in a crappy apartment somewhere South yeah. of Nashville, you know? Yeah. So you don't need like a fancy studio. All you need is garage band and a headphone and an interface and you can pretty much record anything, you know? Right. And, and, you know, you talk about Nashville, but then also, and, and that is, a culture right that's that's kind of the way it is and then we think of like i'm in like north alabama um mm -hmm. so not, it's a little different you know like you're, you're near the music like we're kind of in that kind of bluegrassy type world mm -hmm. um but it may not be like you live in an apartment with a bunch of musicians 
Um, so, you know, the thought is well, one of the things that really inspired me about I believe in your dad's um, first book was when he was talking about, hey, stay where you are and, and use what you got, you know, and and uh, learn from as many people as you can. But but stay where you are and use what you have and, and serve where you are. And I think a combination of all those things is is so is, is good for this new generation to, to hear. So let's talk now about your album. So just last night, um, you finished raising enough money for your Kickstarter, right? What was it just just north of uh, thirty thousand? Uh, yeah, it was uh, third. We, I think it ended on thirty two seven. Okay, okay. So in that, so that's gonna that's gonna fund you to be able to completely do your album, right? Yep. 
Good. And so what all does that include? What, like, I, I know I looked, I looked at the, the Kickstarter website. Um, mm -hmm. What does, for, for someone who doesn't understand what we're talking about when we say Kickstarter, um, yeah. what, what, where is this money going to? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. So most of the money is going towards uh, like the tracking days. So uh, what that includes, there, there are a lot of different aspects of recording a record. There are the beginning stage, which is really fun, where it's like pre-production. Yeah. Uh, so Asher and I already actually did that. So we spent a few weeks in the studio, tr like demoing all of these songs. Um, yeah. and, then, uh, and then we have like tracking days where we rent a studio for a few days. We you know, we pay an engineer, which is like <laughs> pretty expensive. Yeah. And then we pay like players. So we had a couple um, really awesome. We had an electric player and a drummer and a bassist all come and play. And yeah. so, like we all pay them. And then mixing and mastering is also like a really fun stage where. Yeah. Um, yeah and then you pay the producer, of course, Asher, yeah. and also pay me for a month's worth of work. And yeah. Uh, yeah, there's like, there's a, oh yeah. And then like shipping costs for all of the rewards and yeah. it's crazy how fast it adds up. Um, yeah. So yeah. like, I know that I'm just, you know, a beginning artist and yeah. uh, you know, like 30,000 is enough to make a really good sounding record. It's also nothing compared to like what, um, you know, some of the like bigger artists c could spend on an album. Right. Yeah. And, and, the, and the thought behind, you know, definitely, you know, you always have somebody who, who's, who's up here yeah. who uh -huh. but you know you also have somebody down here who's thinking okay 30 grand that's that's like not that's close to like my salary for the year you know like mm -hmm. if you if you put that in, into consideration so you have so now that you have this and you raise this and you've accomplished this goal mm -hmm. what is the product so if you will tell us kind of like your album now i have i have your your music up on spotify here mm -hmm. um tell us kind of what you are planning on putting out here in the next in the future yeah so the plan is to do a few singles sometime uh this spring so okay. hopefully in may and june will be whenever we'll start like re slowly releasing stuff okay. we're, we're still deciding on when the album itself will drop right. uh one of the things i've been trying to fig to uh figure out is how to be patient and to not rush through the process now that we like have the money we've yeah. already kind of been working on it and you know it's really easy to kind of just you know go boom 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 like all right record instead of taking your time with something i am so impatient i'm the most impatient person i know yeah. and uh i so it's one of the things i'm trying to work on is um okay how can i spend the most time and uh to make this record as beautiful as i can with what i have you know right. uh so all that to say i think hopefully it'll be like late summer is when the album will fully be out. But I also, even though a lot of the songs are like close to being done already, I really yeah. want to take my time and like sit with them for a minute yeah. just to make sure they're doing the work that they're supposed to do. Yeah. And so have you, so all the, have all the, all the songs are written. I think so. Okay. <laughs> there, there, we have like 10 songs recorded and okay. there are a couple of them that I'm not sure will end up on the record, but okay. I could be wrong. Okay. And so what is your, you know, kind of what's your heart behind it? So do, do you have a, a, do you have a title for the album yet? Close, but I'm not going to say it just in case okay. it's not, it's not that. Yeah, that's fine. And so, so, okay. So, so what is your, so what are you kind of hoping that um, is portrayed through this and that everybody kind of gets out of it? And, I, and I'm sure every song is different, but as a, as a whole, kind of what are you hoping for this album? Yeah. Uh, so one of the themes that I have picked up on as I'm recording the songs, which I didn't have, it's not a concept record necessarily. So I didn't yeah. have, you know, where I'm going to write about this and that's right. what all the songs are going to point to. Right. I didn't have that, but yeah. I did notice as I was recording that uh, there's a theme of contentment, uh, which also includes learning how to see, learning how to love, learning how to listen. Yeah. And uh, I'm such an impatient person, like I just said, yeah. uh, that I've, kind of always been the type to look towards the next big thing. Uh, yeah. The other day, I, or not the other day, it was like last year, I, I went skydiving with my brothers okay. and it was so much fun. It yeah. was something that had been like number one on my bucket list for a long time. And I remember jumping out of the plane and, you know, like 14,000 feet in the air, like looking yeah. at, you know, Tennessee from 14,000 feet, beautiful. Yeah. 
And I was already thinking, how can I top this? <laughs> like, yeah. what, what other big, exciting thing can I do that's going to be cooler than skydiving, you know? Yeah. So that's kind of like a picture of what I've always been like, where everything I've done has been like temporary going. By the way, that would be a good um, album title. If you ever thought about that skydiving. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Sky's the limit. There we go. Uh, The, yeah. So anyway, I like, I went to England for a year and then I, you know, Africa for a few months and Um, you know, lived in Louisville for a bit. So anyway, like I've traveled so much and I've, um, I've done a lot of things that the thing that's hard, like the braver thing to me is to stay. Like the harder thing is to learn the name of all my neighbors and actually learn to love them and um, not always be thinking of what the next big thing I can do is, but how to bring kingdom here and kingdom now in my heart. Yeah. Now, um, I'm just, like we're. I think we're all kind of future-minded people, and that's not yeah. a bad thing. Like I think it's it's a good thing to strive ahead and to look forward to yearn for something more. Right. However, when whenever you look at the life of Jesus, so much of what he talks about is, um, like loving your neighbor, and you can't do that if you're always moving, and you can't invest in intimacy with people if you're not putting in the time and the practice. You know. Yeah. Uh, there's this awesome book called John Mark Comer because I'm a reader. I'm not, but I have read this book and it's, it's called the ruthless elimination of hurry. And he talks about how um, hurry and love are incompatible. Um, okay. Cause her uh, love takes time and yeah. hurry doesn't have time. Right. And so as like uh, living in a city full of people that are like working really hard to get their name out there and, yeah. you know, be successful and all, I'm surrounded by a lot of driven people yeah. um, I think it's easy to forget that it's okay to like to let the process do its work yeah. and that like it actually takes time to love people yeah. not only love people like I think that we're always concerned with like three different relationships our relationship with ourselves our relationship with God and our relationship with our neighbor yeah. and all three of those things should like it the goal is to let all three of those things be kind of in community with each other. Like that, um, even in writing a song, that song will be for the glory of God, but it will also minister to your neighbor and also like help you understand yourself. Like that would, that's, that's the dream. So looking ahead is a good thing, but also learning, like taking the time to invest in all three of those relationships, learning to love yourself and learning to love your neighbor and learning to love God. I, I think our, you, you have to be able to take your time. Um, yeah. You have to like pray that God is going to open your eyes to see how the kingdom is here and now. Like obviously, um, like we look for the second coming, but we also, there's this beautiful, like this weird paradox where we're kind of, we're in this waiting season, but also yeah. we look around and we see da- daffodils coming back to life and yeah. we see like, um, you know, my friends worshiping or having a worship night in their living room, or I see like a, a church fellowship feasting together. Like these are things that I think are, um, are, are what God wants us, like little visions of what I think the King, what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the kingdom. Um, so anyway, all that to say, I think that the whole album is kind of talking about how to, how to see that. Okay. Uh, when I have a song called, um, resurrection in you that's on the record um i hope that 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 will hopefully be one of the singles because it's about spring and i would love for that to come out in the spring but um the whole theme of that song is um i i can tell that jesus is real because i've seen like the resurrection in um what in you like in this girl that i uh, saw on the second row of church and for like years I saw her in the back row just looking like so bored yeah. like she could have you know nothing to do with it and she'd be totally fine yeah. and then like a few years later I, I saw like this like change happen so yeah. anyway learning to see like Jesus's face and other people and then yeah. the second verse is about um spring and how like we see daffodils coming up to life and we see like sp- the world kind of awakening from winter. That's also a picture of the resurrection. And then we, we find our hearts like broken and weary and wounded. And we know that like, we're, we are also going to finally be resurrected one day too. So like, there's all of this evidence for the Lord's goodness and the Lord's voice. And I think we often expect some big booming 
like heavenly voice whenever because we we throw around the term like you know god god told me this or god spoke to me that can happen but i think that his voice is often uh in people or in nature or in conversations or um maybe not as like big and obvious as we're looking for you know so that's yeah and that and that's good and the thing that i i thought about when you talked when you kind of talk about that in between Mm -hmm. of of we're waiting on something but we're also doing things and it reminds me of of just the conversation that's in in the local church right now you know there there's the conversation of man i can't wait until we get back to to this or we get back to that whereas as we say that we're doing things already you know so so maybe you know we open our eyes a little bit and see no this is this is it i mean this is this is this is the reality of what God's doing in the church. And even though it looks different, um, it still is just as good as yeah. the way it was, was before. And, 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 I hope, and, and that's kind of the message that I hear coming through, through that album. At least that's how it resonates with me. Mm-hmm. And um, you never know how it's going to resonate, resonate with, with everyone. And, and that's, that's the exciting thing about it. So you, so you'll have a couple of singles out here pretty soon come, come spring. Um and then hopefully that full album out late summer. Um, how do you plan? Um, kind of, do you, how do you plan on kind of promoting that? Do you plan? Are you planning on touring? Um, what's what's your plans there? Yeah. So yes, that's the dream. I'm going on Resurrection Letters tour with my dad in okay. the so end of March, which is just a few weeks from now. So yeah. that's like what my spring will look like for the most part. And then hopefully early summer. Um, yeah, I'll get to do like a, a house show tour or something like that. Okay. Um, so if you're listening and when I was the house show, let me know. But yeah. yeah, that's that would be the dream. It would. I think there will be like a, an official like big band release show in Nashville probably yeah. this summer, which will be a blast. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, Scott, I'm looking forward to it. I know everyone else is, and um, just just kind of wrap things up. Yes. Um, I feel like people do know you from your father's music, but I think that if th- those people who do know you from that will learn to love you through what you do. And, mm-hmm. um, and then, but then on the flip side, there is that generation who, who is your generation, who you're going to be, that's who you're going to be to them. You're Scott Peterson. You know, there's, there's nobody before that. You're, you're who you are. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm excited to see what all, what all you do for, for the kingdom. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. If we'll, if you'll hang on just a little bit longer after we get done. Um, but thank you guys so much for listening. Be sure to be on the lookout for everything that Sky has out sometime soon. And if you are in any of the areas that the Resurrection Letters Tour is going to be in, um, do you know any locations kind of off the top of your head? I have no idea. So gotcha. sorry. That's fine. I'm sure it'll be somewhere soon. But if you're around there, she'll be on that with um, with Andrew Peterson. So thank you all for joining us. And I hope you enjoyed this episode of Hymology. Thank you for being with us, Guy. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining me for this episode of Hymology, and thank you for listening to my uh, interview with Sky. And I hope that whenever you see her music coming out here in the near future, that you will um, listen to it, stream it wherever you stream music. But also, if you are anywhere where the Resurrection Tour is at, consider going to see her um, on tour. And thank you for watching this episode of Hymology.